Hey guys, I would encourage you, share the broadcast today. Get into the chat, use your voice. We say this on the broadcast all the time. You are a voice of revival and that voice matters. And so what that means today is that when you start to use your voice in our broadcast through our chat, you are releasing your prophetic sound through the airwaves and you never know who that's gonna affect. And I wanna say this, that you have a voice and it matters today. Make sure you use it.
What's up, everybody? Jeremy Nelson. Thank you guys for joining us. Ben Johnston, all the way from Quebec. We, we need to have testimonies to bring people up. If you need prayer, we want to pray for you. Chris Mathis, honor what you're in. It'll always increase. I, I'm getting spiritually stirred. I am. God wants to fill our homes like a tent of meeting. He wants the pillar of fire. Sickness has to go. The realm of heaven that is being released over every person that is watching. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Facebook Live. I'm Charlie Robinson, and Sammy's not on the broadcast today, but I'm going to be with him tomorrow. Yeah, actually, for about 10 days in, um, in September, we're going to be doing a bunch of meetings, so I'll talk about that a bit, a little bit later. And uh, hopefully you guys are doing really, really good. It's another beautiful day here in British Columbia, so let us know where you're from. Uh, I know there's people all over the world that watch the broadcast, we, and we appreciate it. And uh, South Carolina, I was just talking to Charlie Schaap. I think he lives in North Carolina. <clears throat> And uh, there's so many things happening, so many things. Uh, God's moving all over the world. And, uh, you know, so, so I, I, I talk to some people and they're like, yeah, we got, I don't see God doing much. God's doing a lot and he's moving. God's always moving. And um, if you have an ear to hear, you're going to be able to hear what the Spirit is saying. And so then you know what God is doing. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger they do not listen to. Oh, hi, uh, hi Prairie, Alberta. God bless you, Val. Uh, Arizona, Arizona. We may be coming up to Arizona soon, God willing. Uh, Western Ontario, going to be in Ontario in about a week and a half. Going to be in, um, we, I can't even remember the name of the town. It's about two hours from Hamilton. And pastor, the pastor there is Dan Roberts. They're going to be at Dan's church. They have an awesome, awesome church there. And so that's in the middle, uh, bridge, something bridge, uh, <laughs> Ontario. And I actually might have it written down here. I don't have the name of the town, but anyway, Dan Roberts, you can Google him and find out where his church is at. We're going to be there on the 17th of, uh, this month as well. We're going to be, Sammy and I are going to be at, um, in Leduc, Alberta, um, at the, uh, at the uh, um, the Derrick, and so they're doing two me two meetings and uh, two revival meetings. So we're just going to believe God's just going to blow the place up, not literally, but in the spirit. But it's, if you want more information, go online, look for the Derrick in Leduc, and they'll give you information there. And that's Ria and Andre you can check them out. Then on the Sunday, this coming Sunday morning and Sunday evening, we're going to be at Abundant Life with E Bassett and their and their team. We always, always, always have a good a good time with, with Eve. And um uh, Sammy's gonna be there as well. So all these meetings, Sammy's gonna be there. And then the following week meeting on the Wednesday and Thursday we're at Greg and Val's, but you gotta know Greg and Val to be able to take to be able to get in there. It's in their home. And then of course then I'm off to um I'm off to uh Ontario and then come back to Abbotsford for a couple of days. And then we are going to be in, let's see, what are the dates? Uh, we're going to be in Bonneville on the September 22nd to 24th. So if you live in the Bonneville, St. Paul um, area out there, and that, that's Eastern Alberta, <clears throat> go to Edmonton and you just go right, <laughs> go right across almost to, the, almost to the border, Cold Lakes out there as well. Uh, almost at the Saskatchewan border. So we're going to be there. We're going to be doing a lot of meetings of believing God for revival. And we're doing, we've got, we're, we're setting up, we're rebranding and we're putting together uh, a website. We actually have the name already called Revival Generation. We want to focus on revival. And uh, we, we've done it before, but we're going to really focus on revival in this, in, in this time. And yeah, I talked to Charlie Schaap. He goes, not many revivalists left. And, um, you need to push in for revival. Revival is something that you live. And whether you're in the middle of it or not, in the middle of revival or not, you push in the spirit for it. You believe it. You, you, you have to become like David. I would have fainted had I not believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's how you overcome. You overcome by faith. It's, you're, you're overcoming faith. And how do you overcome by faith? You believe when you don't see it. 
Uh, and because what happens if you stop believing, you faint. As David said, I would have fainted. Not that he, he didn't say I would have fainted had I not seen it. No, he said I would have fainted had I not believed I would see the goodness of the Lord, which is the same as the glory of the Lord in the land of the living before he died. So some people are like, yeah, we'll see the glory in, when we're in heaven. Yeah, but we need it now. <laughs> we, there's, there's a lot of darkness and gross darkness, and people talk about it all the time. We like to talk about the glory and the light. Your eyes shine for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen over you. And so we contend for that. We contend, we pray, we believe God, but you can't just do that. You, you need to move out and do. You know, I was talking to a really good friend of mine uh, the other day. He, he's a very prophetic pastor, young man. Um, and uh, he, well, he's been around for a while, but uh, he, he was asking, we we're talking about all sorts of things. And then he said, Charlie, you have a word for the prophetic and uh, you know, for the for the prophets and the prophetic, you have a word. I said, "Yep, yeah, less talk, more do. Less talk, more do." A, a prophet's job is not is the, even though it's written the same in the Old Testament as it, it is as the word prophet in the New Testament. They're totally two different functions. And some people think the prophets should prophesy all the time, twenty four hours straight. I mean, if the power of God hits somebody and that happens, knock yourself out. But you see, uh, prophetic people, prophets are not just called to say stuff, they're called to do. We're always called to do the kingdom, not just talk about the kingdom. Paul said, and Paul was an apostle, he said the kingdom of God is not a matter of words, but of what power. So there are words, right? But sometimes we, we, we just, we have so many words and we don't see any power generated from it. We have a lot of words, a lot of quote unquote prophetic people talk about prophetic things, give their prophetic opinion. But we're, we're called to move out. So this coming couple of weeks, we are moving out in the spirit and believing God for miracles, signs, and wonders in the glory. And we'll see what God does. And of course, we want to give him all the glory at the end of the day. Amen. So God is good. Dan Roberts, there you are. Muskoka, thank you. Look at that. <clears throat> Dan, it's Muskoka is where we're going. Sorry. It's, uh, I, I remember when I got there, I'm like, where am I? I had to, I phoned the, the front desk. I said, where am I? And I was in, not Bainbridge. What's the other name? There's, there, there we go, Bracebridge. And I said, I'm in Bracebridge. Oh, but you know what? That area is a very, very, very popular place uh, for people to come. And, and not only tourists, there's lots of people from the States, lots of well-known people from the States that, around the world that buy property there. I, I read two different articles in two days about the area how popular it is. People love to go there. They find there's a lot of peace. And so that's where we're going to be going. Uh, Bainbridge. Yeah. So I found out I was in Bainbridge. Can you imagine not even know? Well, I've had that happen when I go to Asia. So I, I, I ask them where I am. It still doesn't help me. I have to get a map. Okay. This is where, here's where I am. Like we've been all over Korea, all over the place. I meet Koreans, a lot of Koreans uh, over the years in, in Canada, some in the States. And, and I'll say, yeah, I, I've been to Korea and, and where are you born? Most of them. I think, I think every single person I talked to was born in Seoul. And I said, well, I've been to uh, Ilsung, Ansung, um, Seoul. I've been down to Jeju Island and uh, Pohang and, um, and uh, Daegu and all over the place. And they're like, man, you, I'm Korean and you've been to more Korean cities than, than I have. That's because when revival dropped in, in a meeting, people go dental miracles and the churches grew like crazy. And, and uh, they end up in 33 different cities in uh, uh, in Korea. Isn't that great how God can do that? So we would visit the different cities that were in revival. And, and uh, this is how God moves. God, God, God is moving. You see, you just got to find out where and where you're supposed to be. And so there's a lot of contending. We do contend for revival. But you have revival in you. So it's, you, you just have to move out in, in what you have. You have to know what you have and then move out in it. And then, and then take a hold of it and see what God does for you. I'm going to just, I'm going to put this up here. I told Shirley I would. And uh, this is, uh, this is our trip, uh, Pro Project Israel 2024. We've been a number of times to Israel. And there's my beautiful wife there. And there's me. And there's uh, the flag in the back. And uh, we're going with Restoring Hope to Cities, uh, but also with um, Bridges for Peace, a ministry uh, that is, uh, in Canada and the United States, but they have a whole um, uh, team 
a permanent team in Israel. And so they minister to the people of Israel, the love of God. So it's Christians loving um, Jews, loving the people of Israel, loving the Arabs that are there. The 16th, 27th, January 16th to the 27th. And I encourage you to come. And uh, some people, well, I'll pray, but a lot of people, their praying is, man, I don't have enough money, so I can't go. That's not how you pray. You pray, Lord, you want me to go or not? And if God wants you to go, he'll provide. That's the way life works, you guys, for us. That's the life of faith. Faith, you're, you're, you live on the edge and you believe God for what you don't have. What, what you do have, you don't need any faith because you have it. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you already have something, then it's not faith. And, and uh, not, not even hope. But, it, but, so faith is taking hold of the things that, that you desire, whatsoever things you desire. When you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. And when the closer you walk with God, spend time with God, the more you will know what God wants for your life. It's amazing. This is how it works. And so if you want to go to Israel, your heart is to go to Israel, pray, Lord, and then find out how to pray. Don't beg and be, oh, I don't have any money. God, how am I going to do it? Just believe all things are possible to him that believes. There's so many miracles of people are, are, that are able to go to, to Israel with us. And it's miraculous. And other trips. And you're on a fixed income. You, you know what? You're... If you're a part of the kingdom, you're not on a fixed income ever because God is your source of the bank in heaven. And you can believe God for, for more than enough and for more than your fixed income, right? And more than what you have in the bank. And, and we need to do this. We need to believe God. He will supply all of our needs according to his riches in what? In glory. Praise God. Okay. So that's, that's Israel. So come with us to Israel. We just had some number of people here. Uh, Say they're coming and uh, filling out the papers, putting in their um, putting in their deposit. So we're really, really looking forward to that. We love we love going to Israel. It's always, it, you know, it's fun. I, I don't know. For me, it's fun. The first time was a real eye opener, right? And then the then all the rest of the times has been fun. And God opens doors and crazy things happen. Like eighty six year old ladies riding camels and, <laughs> and all sorts of great and baptizing people in the Jordan River. And, and uh, you know, floating on a boat and on the Gal Sea of Galilee. I mean, these are those are real places, and we get to do that. Seeing all the ruins and the Roman ruins that are all over the place, seeing the Garden Tomb, and um, and all these places. So I we we love Israel. Uh, we want to bless Israel. If you bless Israel, you'll be blessed, right? And that's what the Bible says. And so we believe in blessing natural Israel, because Paul said this is not the spiritual first; it's first the natural. And then the spiritual, hallelujah. You know, remember to, uh, to, to forward this, um, share the, share the, um, share this. There might be somebody that's sitting around today saying, I need something from God. I need, I need to, you know, I need to get uplifted. You know, just send them a link. Say, look, take a, take a look at this. Sandy had so many people on, uh, uh, uh that were, that got saved. Yeah. Especially young people during COVID and a number of them probably a couple of dozen of people who were suicidal, who somebody sent a link to them, said, you need to watch this right where they were going to end their life. And uh, they didn't, and they got saved. It's just amazing. <laughs> Dan is letting everybody know, two hours north of Toronto. That's right. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for healing too, Lord, as we speak. We thank you for healing, that the healing power of God is here today. Hi, uh, John. Uh, La Framboise. La, I like the name La Fram Framboise because Framboise means raspberry, literally. The raspberry. His name is The Raspberry. <laughs> and I used to work in uh, a raspberry farm, a big one, like 200 acres. Or, or I ran it for, for a farmer. And so uh, raspberries are anointed. We're, we're, Abbotsford, where there is the raspberry capital of Canada. Wow, that's, and we have an air show, big air show. It's the, uh, I think, the second biggest air show in the world. It, it is here we just had it and we're close to the airport so with those jets come just flying barely over our house and um so that's exciting anyway that's good uh sammy and i were talking yesterday and again don't forget tell your friends write it down sammy and i are going to be out this this weekend and um you, you can check voice revival they got some of the posters and also the next week as well we're going to be out and so we're believing god is going to uh 
uh, going to give us revival. He's going to move miracles, signs, wonders, and and the glory. And people are like, well, we don't need those. Yeah, we need those. You talk too much about it. No, we don't. Most of the church never talks about this stuff. And less, and less of the church moves in it. And so we need it more than ever. We need to see God move. Jesus said, cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the love. And he said, freely you receive, freely what? Give. And so I want to encourage you that each one of you has that, has an anointing. The Bible says we've all been anointed. So this is uh, Janine. Pray for my family that... God will restore, put my family back together, pray for my mom, brother, niece to talk to us for communication and forgiveness toward it. Lord, we just want to release your hand over that family and all those people right now. Your hand, your hand, your hand, your hand, your hand. Good. We have somebody here from Georgia. Good. God bless you. Georgia. I don't know if I've been to Georgia, Atlanta. Yeah, I have. I've been all, all over the place and some of the places I forget. I probably forgotten more than I remember. When it comes to the, the things of, of uh, where I've been, and um, I remember Albuquerque though, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and all of these wonderful places. How did I, and, and all the the Panhandle of Texas? We did meetings there, just to meet six hundred people showed up. It was uh, amazing. And you say, well, how does that happen? You got, you know what? God does it. I don't know. P people get a hold of me. They find they find me. And uh, I used to be years ago. So during the Fresh Fire years, I was turning down three international invitations a day. So I was turning down three international uh, uh, invitations a day. That's how busy it was. I had to pray. I had to be always praying, praying for Lord, which one, which one, which one. We ended up going to Asia a lot and been all over the place. I, the reason I'm saying this, you guys, if I can do this, you can do this, is sometimes we look at people, yeah, that's their call. That, uh, yes, they're called, but there's more people that are called. And and many are uh, many are called, but few are chosen. And really, I heard one guy preach on that. It's few pass the test. See, if you're called, you have to take a hold of your calling. If you have a mantle, you take a hold of the mantle. You don't let the thing go, and you walk with God, and you believe by faith. This is a walk of faith. Ministry is a walk of faith. Life is a walk of faith, and we need to learn how to walk by faith. But people are more comfortable in what they already have and what they already know. And so for some people, it's hard and, and, and they'll just sort of excuse themselves. Well, that person has this, or they have this, or they have that head started, you know, no, everybody's been given the measure of faith. It's up to us to increase it. It's up to us to believe God. It's up to us to, to, to see the goodness of the Lord and lend living. That's what this life is all about. And you, you may say, well, I, you know, I have a mother of three and at home, uh, most of the time and I'm, I'm cooking the meal. You know what? The highest calling you can have as a woman is a mother. If you don't have kids, you don't feel condemned because you can have spiritual children. But the highest calling of a woman is being a mother. It's not about having, you know, as much money as men have. You know, we need to get paid exactly the same as men. Great. I'm for that. But, you know, that's not your highest calling is to be paid as much as a man is. And a man's highest calling is to be a father. That's the, you cannot have a higher calling than that. Even God himself, when the disciples asked Jesus to pray, what did, how did he pray? Our father, he could have said, our God, our mighty God, the great I am. But he didn't. He said, our father, which means he didn't say my father. When he was preaching to the Pharisees, he said, my father. But when he was with the disciples and they wanted him to pray, he said, our father. So what's the highest calling of God? A father, he's our father. Ooh, uh, I tell you, you start meditating on that. Then you start meditating on what a good father is like, because a good father, a good father, he's a good, loving father. He only means well for us. He doesn't mean anything evil for us. It's amazing. God is a good God, and he's an amazing father. And so, men, your highest calling is to be a father. And if you don't have natural children, just believe God that you can fa you can father people. I mean, I've I've had people call me, you know, father of their revival or father of their or, or their spiritual father. And I didn't meet them for a couple of years. They just saw me on the Internet and somehow it touched their heart and it helped them. And they felt that I was the father. I don't go around saying I'm this person's spiritual father. And that, but I don't do that. But but some people do. They come to me or they, they're preaching. They go, you know, here's Charlie, my spiritual father. And I'm like, I didn't know that. But you don't have to know that. You just have to be who you are and believe God that you're going to raise up sons and daughters. 
in the spirit. So the highest calling of man is a father, highest calling of woman is a mother. And, 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 and then there's the husband and wife. And, um, but as far as your productivity is being a father and mother, that's why, it, that's why God said to Adam and Eve in the garden, be fruitful and multiply. That was one of the very first things, charges he gave them, which means you're going to be a mother and you're going to be a father. And so be fruitful and multiply, not be fruitful and maintain. Many people, for some reason, they're like, I'm going to maintain what I have. And so I've got all this stuff. I'm just holding on, and wait for Jesus to come back. And hopefully the rapture comes and I'm going to be gone. And, and I, I don't want to lose what I have. It's not how you live your life. You're not called to maintain anything. You're called to, you're called to uh, multiply what he, God has given you. How do you multiply? By giving it away, by using it, by doing something. Not just by saying, by doing something and by moving out. It's amazing. The kingdom is very, very simple. Um, you know, you look at the problems of the world. And I often, you know, or you'll hear something, you see, you'll see something. And, and if you watch too much news, you'll see it all the time. So don't watch too much news. But, you know, the, the world is full of problems. And so we're called to be problem solvers. But here's the deal. The answer is very simple. If everybody would do, everybody on earth would do what Jesus told them to do. It's so simple. Uh, love your neighbors yourself, right? What sort of things you'd have people do to you or for you, you do for them. Simple. And if everybody did that, we wouldn't have any crime. We wouldn't have any problems. We wouldn't because we would love our brother. We would love them. And we would do to them as we would have them do to us, which means there'd be no more stealing. There'd be no more murdering. There'd be no more robbing. There'd be no more lying. All those things would be gone. It's amazing, you know, the world talks about all this and there's all, the, and then of course, and there's no hate here. And you see that, yeah, but there's no love there either. You just, you, you, the world says, we don't hate. We, well, actually they do. They, they're allowed to hate people that they're in disagreement with, but we love those, they don't say, use the word love, but they're, you know, we have total acceptance here and we accept everybody and there's no hate here. Well, that's a lie because the groups that don't agree with them, they hate. And so as Christians, you're called to love. God is love. We're called to love. This is what puts things back together. Love. Love is what ever, this is all about. If you love your neighbor as yourself, if you do unto others as, as you would have them do unto you, I'll tell you, that's, that's how it works. And then we wouldn't have all this garbage. But you see, the devil knows these things. So what does he do? He just reverses it and just throws out and, and uh, onto people. And so then they, they begin to harbor rejection, harbor bitterness, harbor the things that spring up and destroy, uh, har harbor jealousy, har harbor dishonor. All those things, you're not loving your neighbors yourself. And you don't want them to do that to you. But if you do it to other people, man. And we've all, we, we're all growing in that. And hopefully we're all learning at the same time. So God is good. I'm going to talk about what Sammy and I were talking about yesterday uh, privately. And uh, he had ministered on the broadcast he was talking about oil and it's really very 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 interesting um because i've been, i've been called to the oil for years and years and years and many years before i really knew what it was god would just tell me you're called to the oil you called to i've anointed you know when they anointed people in the old testament they did some oil and they put it on their head we even do that now the bible says even in the new testament you're going to pray for the sick anoint them and then and then pray for them the elders of the church <clears throat> but there's something about oil that you have to have, especially this, the darker times get, the more oil you need, because you need, what does oil do? Talk about oil for a lamp. An oil for a lamp, uh, the reason why oil is important is so that you can see, because if you run out of oil, then you can't see anymore. Very, very important. It seems so simple. But the thing is, the, the, uh, in, in Matthew 25, it's, it says, there's 10 virgins, and if you've heard this before, probably, so, but don't default. Oh, yeah, I know that one, the 10 virgins, I didn't have the extra one. Yeah, listen to this like it's the first time you ever heard it. There's 10, 10 virgins, and five were, fool, uh, five were wise, five were foolish. The foolish took um, no oil with them. So they had lamps, but they didn't take any oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So they had extra oil. And but while the bridegroom was delayed, it, it's the delays in life that qualify or disqualify most people. 
It's you can find it in the Bible. Jesus talked about it a number of times. The master gave this, this, this to to his servants, and his he delayed his coming. And when he delayed his coming, some people went sideways. And what does that mean? He he didn't he didn't come when they expected. And it usually means not not he's coming too quick. It usually means, almost always means, he actually comes later than what you think. And why do we know that? Because that's that's the story of the oil. That's why we talk about the oil. That's why Jesus talked about the oil, because the people who didn't have extra oil didn't think the journey was going to be that long. They thought they were going to see the bridegroom, and they had plenty of oil, so they didn't need extra oil. So they didn't get extra oil. They didn't realize it was going to take longer than what they thought. And there's so much bad theology over the last 100 or 200 years and time theology is not people that read out of orbit and they and they're thinking well jesus should have come by now <laughs> like what happened 2020 came it's like where, where did god go it's on the throne <laughs> and in charge but but what happens is if you if you let yourself go there people then get discouraged and then people run out i, I tell you there's people god told me in during COVID, there's people went up people went down and people disappeared just, you don't even know where they went. And and you have to watch out during the delay, when the delay is there. So when there are delays, that's where most people's faith fails. They're believing God. And they're like, man, I've been believing. I just, you know, how come it didn't happen? How come it didn't happen to me? Or why did this happen to me? And why is this always happening to me? Don't I never ask those questions, number one, so stop asking them. You can ask why, but in the sense, like a child. But but if you're asking, oh, why is this? That? No, God doesn't like to hear that, so stop that. And and it, if you don't watch out, the delays in life, they'll sour you. You'll be a bitter person because you thought the Lord was going to come back a long time ago, or you thought these things, are, your family members are all going to be saved by now. We thought these things were all going to happen, and, and I would have things this way. And, and look at my life now. You see, the delays of God, have a way that I'm talking to not the delays of the devil, the delay of God has a way of purifying us during those times, because that's when it takes faith because you don't see the answer yet. And maybe you've been praying for quite a while. Now you don't see the answer. Can't stop. You know, Sammy and I, so many times on trips, we would, we would, uh, and you know, we, especially in the beginning of ministry, I mean, we were just bumping along, not really know what we were doing. And, and sometimes, you know, people said they were going to give you so much and then they gave you like that much. And, and we had to learn, okay, this is the way it goes. And 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 people would use you in various different ways. And we'd just go back to the hotel and laugh. And then years later, something would happen again. And, and we'd look at each other. I knew exactly what Sam would be thinking. Remember, Dad, back in the day, I said, yeah, we'd laugh. And, we're just, and Sam would go, you know, Dad, let's just keep moving forward. Because we're not seeing it like we thought. We, I remember we did a bunch of um, conferences and uh, Canadian oil conferences, and most of them were amazing. Some of them were huge, packed out churches. But a couple of them, there was just a handful of people. Like, oh, and we had big bills to boot, right? And you're thinking, well, hi, why isn't everybody here? But you, but you know what? you got to trust God. And we would go back to the hotel, and we'd laugh. we just laugh. we just start laughing. You know what? Because it delayed. It wasn't happening the way we thought. But you see, it never does in life. It, it, God is constant, but he's also different. And, and he moves differently, you know, right? You ever, you ever look at the mountains and wonder why God just didn't make them like this? The mountains that are all like this and, and they're so beautiful, but they're not all exactly the same. They're, they're different. Your fingerprints, do why is your fingerprint different? Because God makes everything different and God treats every person we, the same in one way, but different in another way. Just like you can have, if you have seven children, you treat them fairly, right? Right across the board, but each one of them, as a different personality, so you'll be relating to them in a different way, and each one of them will see you differently, even as a father. And so you have to find your place with God. What does God think of you? A lot of people they they can't even look in the mirror and say, "God, what do you think of me?" Because they're afraid of what God might think of them, and so they get afraid, and, and they get afraid of God, and so then they don't want to make a mistake. And then what they do is they try to maintain, and they take their talent, and then they bury it. And when God shows up, they go, "God, here's your talent." What happened to that guy? He lost it. And, and, and the master gave it to the guy that had, had made five and he ended up with 10. Now he's got 11 because he's got that guy. Why? Because he tried to maintain because he was afraid. If you're afraid, you're not moving in fear. Uh, pardon me. If you're afraid, you're moving in fear. You're not moving in faith. And so these, these are things, you guys, you can just get over them. You know, it's like stepping out. 
It's like stepping out and talking to somebody about Jesus. When your heart starts going, but, 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 oh boy, I think I should talk to this person about the Lord. And if you ignore that too long, you're, it's not going to happen to you then. And you'll just say, oh, that's for somebody else. That's for an evangelistic person because I'm really a quiet, shut person. It's for everybody. Preach the gospel, heal the sick. I mean, I, I remember one time I was, I was in England uh, and you talk about the oil. See, this is the oily stuff. This is a lie. You see, the, the, what, what the anointing is, it's an oily substance with a healing property. That's what the anointing is. And so it's, it's an, like an oil. It is an oil in the spirit. And God wants to anoint your head with oil. That's what David said. He said, he, he, you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Wow. What did, what did Job say? The rocks poured out oil for me. Wow. They had lots of oil, extra oil, running over oil. That's what you want. Lots of oil, excessive oil. Well, you guys are so excessive. Yes, excessive oil. But you learn how to use it, not just be around it, because you got to step out. It's not, you got to step out from time to time and say what God tells you to say. I mean, I was in England and not Exeter. Uh, I was in, uh, I think it was in Dudley. Yeah, Dudley, England. And um, I'd had a dream. And in the dream, this guy was co coming after Sammy with this short handle sledgehammer. It was The handle was about this long. And Shirley was in the front row when I was sharing that. I think Sammy might have been there too. And he had this sledgehammer and he was going after Sammy. And um, and I'm like, um, I'm just going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to intervene. So I went over and I grabbed this guy. He looked like a big wrestling and he turns around. And so I'm wrestling this, this thing, this hammer thing. And then I start hitting him. Well, I just made him matter. And with that hammer, and all of a sudden I picked up a sword and whoosh, off with his head. That was a dream. Can you imagine? When I was in England, I'm like, oh man, that, that's a dream. That's, you just felt like, oh, a manly man, you know, you just defeated the, this uh, demonic thing and just with the sword of the Lord, you know, and I woke up, wow. So I went to church on Sunday morning. I'm standing, I, 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 I'm preaching at the church. And <clears throat> all of a sudden, as I'm preaching, I look to the side and I see an anvil. You know what an anvil is? The, the one that, that falls on Wiley Coyote right out of the sky. <laughs> an anvil yeah, that they put steel on and they make stuff, right? And, and uh, and anyway, that's there. But they had a flag over it. It had a bunch of swords. And I'm looking at this thing. This is the next the next day, I believe, a day or two after the dream. And I look at the flag. And the flag has a sword in the middle. And in the four corners are, are uh, sledgehammers, like with six-inch handles. I mean, I've never even seen one uh, sledgehammer like that. I'm like, what is this? Like, this is crazy. I've never seen this before in my life. And I and so I said, I said, um, uh, um, who put this here? <laughs> and then, so the pastor goes, oh, that was a church from France and from the city in France that for five or 600 years, they made all the swords of, for the kings of France. And so they actually brought one of the old anvils, rusty old anvil and sat it there. And that's the flag of the city. The flag of the city is a four short handle sledgehammers. <laughs> I kid you not. This is my life, you guys. <laughs> this is my life and with a sword in the middle. And I'm looking, okay. And, and, and I, then I said this, it just came out of my mouth. And I thought, okay. And I was just going to keep preaching. And out of my mouth, my wife was sitting right, sitting here. I think Sammy was beside her. The other pastor was here. And then Tom, our driver was sitting over here. And I went, Tom, Tom, do you have a short handled sledgehammer on you? And then I, and people laughed and I, I kept, I'm talking. You see, sometimes you just open your mouth and God's going to fill it. I said, do you have a short handle sledgehammer on you? And all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I, I'm preaching what I don't even know what I'm pre preaching something else. He leans into this bag, like his, his uh, Bible bag, and he takes out a short handle sled sledgehammer, just like I had in the dream, just like we're on the, and I'm looking at him and he holds it up and the whole place went silent. They had about six or 700 people. It just went silent. And I went, well, I said, uh, you brought a short-handled sledgehammer to church on Sunday morning. This, I said, what is going on? I was going to say, some people would think you're in the twilight zone. You're not in the twilight zone. 
you're just in the zone, the heavenly zone, right? When these things happen. And he says, well, I didn't bring it to church this morning. He said, I actually lent this. So he's got it. And he stands up. He says, I actually lent this sledgehammer, which was only had a handle this big, this sledgehammer to this guy over there. And some guy stands up and he's waving. He said, six months ago, I lent this to him. And he said, this morning on the way in the church, as we're going through the door, he goes, oh, by the way, he says, here's your sledgehammer. He goes, what am I supposed to do with this? He goes, I'll put it in your Bible bag. You can take it home after and he had a short, I said, give me that short handle sledgehammer. I took that thing and I went over the anvil and I took off, I took off the sword. I started hitting that anvil, uh, banging the, the sparks were flying and I was praising God. Thank you, Jesus. I picked up a few of the swords and I, I don't usually do that. Like there's some people like good with the flags, they get the flags going or whatever. And I've seen people with the sword. You got to watch out with the, these are like real swords, but I'm up there. I thought, you know what, if I had a dream like that, and at the, and the, the stuff I dreamt about are here. And the guy brought in the sledge, same kind of sledgehammer. I'm going to do something. We're gonna, I'm going to make a declaration because God's on the move. And so I did this. And, and then I, I'm done. I, I thought, oh, we just did something in the spirit. And I start to preach. And then I'll, I all of a sudden I see all these people. They're looking at me. Even Shirley. And she's, I can see, they're, they're looking, they're pointing at me. And, and then and it's Shirley's like, she pointed to her shoulder and, I'm, and and then me and I'm thinking, honey, what's going on? She goes, look at your shoulder. So I looked at my right shoulder and it was, you've seen gold dust, ever seen gold dust in people? This wasn't gold dust. This was like gold flakes. It was all over my right shoulder and a little bit on my back and a, little, a tiny bit here. But my shoulder had, it was like corn flakes of gold. It was amazing. And I'm, I'm, and when that happens, the glory of God that comes in, because God's glory is now manifesting in the natural. If you don't think that freaks people out and God can't use that, I'm telling you, you're in the wrong kingdom. God uses that kind of stuff all the time. And so I've got this. So, man, I'm, uh, you know, Joshua Mills, he gets gold a lot. And so I would preach and put my shoulder out like this and say, you know, the Lord's, because <laughs> I'd never had it happen before. So we go out for lunch afterwards. And this, this is what I wanted to say. This is. Open your mouth and God will fill it, right? And so we go out and we're with all these pastors and you could feel the power of God right there when we're eating. And I really wasn't interested in eating. And so we ordered something and I'm sitting there and I kept looking at my shoulder. All of a sudden this waitress comes by and she's got a, a whole whack of drinks. Because in, in England, almost every restaurant's like mostly pub, a pub and then tables around it, right? So she's got these drinks, she comes by. And all of a sudden, she looks at me. She goes, what is that? She looks at the gold. I said, that's gold. Take a look at that. She goes, well, where did you get it? I said, uh, well, where did it come from? She said, I said, heaven. And when I said heaven, she's got the, her drinks like this. She's a waitress, right? When I said heaven, she goes, I feel very spiritual right now. I feel very spiritual right now. And tears started coming down the right. That's all I said. She asked me where it came from. I said, it came from heaven. She starts crying. I feel very spiritual right now. And then when she, as soon as she said that, I saw her life. I saw that she was a dancer. I said, you're a dancer. How do you know that? And then I, all the, these things in her life I saw, and, and I was just, you know, God was just showing me her life. And so I said, you ever been to church? Nope. I said, you've never been to church? Nope. How old are you? 26. And then every now and then she go, I feel really spiritual right now. What is happening? In the middle of the bar, pub, restaurant. And then, of course, and she puts the drinks down. She's standing there. And I said, listen, would you like to receive Jesus Christ? Because that's why you're feeling heaven. Because Jesus came from heaven. He died for our sins. And God raised him from the dead. Now he's back in heaven. And he's in, in praying for us. I said, would you like to receive Jesus as your Savior? Yes, I would, please. I would. I said, okay, let's do it right now. Now, this woman had never prayed in her life. Because she told me, I never prayed. I said, just, I'm going to pray. And you just follow. Just believe. You're already believing because you know there's something going on. You can feel heaven. Can I say that? A, a person never been to church knew enough that what they were feeling was heaven. I know tons of Christians that wouldn't know heaven if, they, if it fell on them because they, they, they don't believe that God does stuff like that today. They don't believe in miracles, signs, and wonders, the glory. They don't believe it. They haven't been taught it, so they don't believe it, or they've been taught against it. And this woman, who would never been to church, could feel heaven. Oh, God is good. I think that's what people felt when they got around Jesus. Felt heaven. They just felt heaven. And and I want to, I that's my greatest desire is that people, when I walk into, into somewhere, people would feel heaven. 
I, I was in a school for many years, well, seven years in alternate school. Those kids could feel heaven every single day, and they come and tell me. They go, "What is that? What do I feel around?" You'd ask when I when I stand beside you, I feel I said heaven or the glory. And they're like, "Wow, can I sit down?" And they just sit there because they liked it. They're like, "Whoa, man!" And they were they could discern that there was a different atmosphere. It's a glorious atmosphere. Anyway, I said, "Let's." Pr I said, "Let's pray." The girl had never prayed, so she didn't even close her eyes, right? She just prayed. I, I would pray, pray. And so I didn't close my eyes. I just looked at her. And she prayed. I prayed. I said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And she received the Lord. And I watched that woman's face go from death to life, just like that. Just like that. Death to life. I watched her go from death to life in the spirit. And I looked at her and went, man, that's not the same one that was there five minutes ago. Because she's now born again, right? And she came to two of our meetings. It was it was amazing, too, the, a revival meeting she came to. And all because it had this dream. And then there was a sword. And the guy brought the, brought the sword and the sledgehammer. Ah, you know what? If you want to try to figure God out, have a go at it. Knock yourself out. It's not going to work. Like, how did God do all that? I mean, he did it. Who did he do it for? Yes, me. Yes, the people. Mostly for her. For that woman. It wasn't even at the meeting. God put some gold on my shoulder and, and when, I, when I said where it came from. Because when I said heaven, you see, that we need to, be, to bring people heaven. We need to talk about heavenly things. Jesus said in John chapter 3, if I cannot tell you about earthly things and you don't understand, how can I tell you about heavenly things? Not spiritual things, heavenly things. God wants us to talk about heavenly things. We talk so much about what's wrong on the earth. Let's talk about heavenly things. Let's talk about the oil. Let's talk about the wine. We want the extra oil, extra oil, extra oil. So I knew I was called years and years ago, like probably 35 years ago. I knew I was called to the oil. They didn't understand it, but the oil, yeah, the oil. Because it says there, uh, the ones that didn't bring oil, they say to the wise, give us some of your oil. And they says, no, we can't. Let's, let's we run out. And then they say, go to those that sell and buy. That, that's my job in the kingdom. Now, don't sell it for money. You, you not sell it for money. It's like Sammy says, it's time. It takes time. It's like, it's like when, you, when you're with your family uh, and somebody would say, well, you're, what'd you do this weekend? I spent time with my family. You need to spend time with God to get these things, to receive these things, to understand these, spend time with God. That's how you buy them. And so my job is to offer it up and say, it's here. There's oil. You can have oil. You can have as much as you want. Your cup can run over. The rocks can pour out oil for you, but God wants to give you oil. Oil it can be wisdom as well. Lamps, right, can represent wisdom. And the, the, the seven lamps uh, before the throne of God, seven spirits of God. And so, so the oil is very, very important commodity. But I knew that I'd been called to the oil. <clears throat> now, listen to this. Our destinies are so wrapped up in what God has for us. But sometimes we're just so afraid or we just don't look. I don't know. Some people just don't look. They don't look. They, even if it was a burning bush, yeah, it was a burning bush. It, like, you got to look. You got to be interested. You got to be in awe. Stay in awe all the time. And I remember one day, all of a sudden, this is what, it was the oddest thing. I was walking around and I, and it was like, it was like I could feel my, my, it was like, when my mother was pregnant with me, I could feel her excitement. All of a sudden, I'm like, wow. It's like, my, I know what my mom was thinking. I know I could feel it. She had so much excitement. And the excitement was, and then, can you imagine? I'm already an adult. I'm already in ministry. But the excitement was that there was going to finally be another male born into the Moore family. And I'm like, what? Because I'm the only male. I have, I have, um, in the Moore family, my, my mom's side. So it's my, my mom uh, uh, and, and she had two sisters and they, his, uh, one of her sisters, she passed away before she had any children. The other had two girls. So I was the only one, the only male. So that's the only, I'm thinking, what do you mean another one? Uh, I'm the only one. Like, I mean, pardon me. I wasn't born yet, but the, there's another one. And I, I'm thinking there's another, there's another one. And the Lord said to me, yep, yeah, you had an uncle. And, uh, and I said, on your mom's side, I said, I don't have an uncle. We try to make sense of stuff sometimes. God's ways are past finding out, so we should stop. But we do anyway. We're like, I don't have an uncle. And God's like, yeah, you have an uncle on your mother's side. You had an uncle on your mother's side. And I'm like, I'm going to phone up my mom. Because we were living in Canada. She's in Vermont. 
I said, Mom, I got, got a question. It seems odd. You've never talked about this. I said, did I ever ha have an uncle, like, on your side of the family? Like, an uncle? She said, well, you sort of did. And I went, I did? And, yeah, but he died at childbirth. So he was alive. And then when, when he was when he were, gave him birth, he died. And I didn't know that. And that was, uh, um, that was, of course, her mother's, would have been her mother's son, my uncle, right? And um, I went, man, I never knew that. And, and, and I said, I thought I'm the only male. Well, you are that lived. And so I, I'm thinking, okay, what, why is this even coming to me? And then the Lord said this, Charlie, your uncle who died at birth, still stillborn or died at birth, one or the other, had the anointing of oil in his life. And the devil stole it. But he said that anointing that he had when you were born, it came on you. And he says, so you have the anointing of oil that he would have had, and you're going to fulfill the ministry that I'd given him. You're actually going to fulfill it, and the devil's not going to stop it. That's what God told me. And I'm sitting there going, okay, now this is new territory for me. I've never heard of this kind of stuff before. So I go back to Quebec. And I end up going to, uh, there's a church where my parents are married, and in behind is a cemetery. And it's where my grandparents are, are, are buried, and some of my aunts are buried there. Like, so I go around the back, I look, and I look at my grandfather's gravestone, more, big, great, big graves, more. And I go around, it says, uh, pardon me, in the front, it says Margaret, that was his wife, and his name was uh, Charles, as well as where I get my name from. So I'm looking to see if there's a little place to see if they buried who my uncle was. I didn't know what his name was. Um, uh, and so I go around the back of the big like marble monument, right in the corner, engraved in the corner. It said, um, Edward Derrick Moore, born like 1939, died 1939. And I went, oh, that's him. And then I looked at his name. His name was Derrick. That was his middle name. And God goes, that is the anointing that's on your life. Your anointing is to supply oil to the body of Christ. Encourage them to get oil and to get more oil. And how are you going to do it? Through miracles, signs, and wonders. Through bringing in the presence of God. Through bringing in heaven. Through bringing in the glory. Bringing in hope. This is how you're going to do that. You're going to tell people there's you can have as much oil as you want. Just, just pack it in. Just go to God. And some people in there might, well, how do I get it? I don't know how to get it. Just go to God and ask him how to do it. You know, you go to God. You do it by faith. Stuff by faith. Don't try to figure it out. You need oil. Jesus talked about oil. So that means we need oil. Some were foolish. Some were wise. We don't want to be foolish, so we need more oil. Well, I don't know how to go and get it. Ask God. And but. Even more than that, you need to get around anointed people. You need to be in anointed meetings. You know why you need to be in anointed meetings? So you can get some oil because God's always given something away. And revival has an oil to it. Revival, when you're sitting there, it's like God is just, it's like he just backs the truck up and puts the hose in you and he's filling you up. But it's not just to fill you up so you feel good. And wow, now you got to use it. How do you use it? You put it in that lamp, and then you have light, and you have night, light not just for you, but you have light for other people. Freely you receive, freely give. And so that's that's what I do. That's what I have to have. When I go in, I'm like, give me a lot of oil because i got to release the oil. There's people here that need it, and there's but a lot of people don't think they need it, and then they don't understand. Well, I don't understand how to do it, and I can't do it, and I tried that. Well, don't, don't try to do it. Just do it. Believe God. David said, you anoint my head with oil. So God, you anoint my head with oil. I still don't get it. Who cares if you get it or don't get it? You'll get the oil if you believe it by faith. Every opportunity of faith has an opportunity of doubt, every single one. Every opportunity and everything God has for you, there's an opportunity to, to doubt that fact that he's got it for you. That's how the devil comes. He did, did the same to Adam and Eve. You know, did, did, did God tell you not to eat from that, uh, you know, touch, eat the, the tree, whatever. And then, and then, and then she says, yeah, we'll surely, yeah, you'll surely not die. This is, yeah, this, he just, he put in a seed of doubt. That's all he did. He put in a seed of doubt that God was really that good. And then he went on to say the reason why you can't, because if you do eat from that tree, you're going to be like God. You're going to know good and evil. So God, God's keeping it back from you. And some people think that they're like, oh yeah, it's, you can say that because of, no, 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 you can say that. God is good for you. God wants to fill you up with it. You need to try this. 
you know what? Some of your breakthrough is most of your breakthrough is going to come through here is how you literally visualize how you think of God, how you think of him as your father. Do you believe? Can you believe all things? Even you, I believe all things. But I don't feel like I do. So what? You don't feel like I do. I have prayed for people that haven't felt anything and seen some of the biggest, greatest miracles my whole life when it seemed nothing. When I feel nothing, feel nothing, not seeing nothing, don't feel nothing. I remember my brother had cancer. He had he had his uh, he had uh, cancer because the head the head nurse of, of the hospital saw I saw her a few hours earlier. I didn't know my brother was even in in uh, the hospital or had cancer because we hadn't lived at home for over a year. And she goes, "Yeah, your your brother's going to be operated on Monday, and he's not going to make it." And I said, "What?" Yeah, I said, what's the problem? What's the problem? You don't know? I said, no, I haven't talked to him for a year or anybody from my family, that part of my family. And she, she goes, yeah, I've seen all the, the all the, uh, the x-rays and the biopsies, but he's got cancer and all those lymph glands, all his organs have cancer and his lungs are spotted with cancer. Um, and he had, and, and she said he will go in and the, 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 the uh, doctor is a friend of his, the only reason he's operating because he begged him. He says, you, you know, you're not going to make, he says, I want you to operate anyway. So, so I drove straight home. I was like five minutes away. I drove straight home and it was like a morgue. I mean, they already ordered the flowers, you guys. So it was Friday. I come in on on um, on Monday and it was just like a morgue. And I walked to my brother. I felt nothing. I felt zero faith. I felt zero feeling, zero heaven. Didn't feel the heaven then. It didn't matter. I went by faith. I'm going to, this is my brother. I'm going to pray for him. So I just stood in front of him. My dad and mom were there. They weren't believers yet. I didn't care. I just said, listen, I'm going to pray for you right now. And I, and, and he said, and he had received the Lord a year before, because I sent a book to my dad. He read it and got saved. And he goes, you know, I really haven't been following the Lord. I said, listen, then none of that matters right now. I said, you're going to die on Monday. The nurse told me if you don't get healed, if God doesn't heal you. And he goes, yeah, I know. And, and, and uh, the only reason they're operating on you is is because you're the guy's free or the surgeon's friend. And he goes, yeah. And, and, and so anyway, I said, I'm going to pray for you. And this is all I, this is what I said. I said, cancer, that's in my brother. Dan, I said, I curse you. Die in Jesus' name. That's all I did. I spoke to the cancer to die. That's what come out of my mouth. I, I practiced it. I didn't know what I was going to say. I just said that cancer in my brother's body, I command you to die all that cancer. That's all I said. I and after the prayer, I'm like, praise God. And then, and then we went home. And I get a call on the following Friday. It, you know, you'd be some shocked what comes out of your mouth. Because he phones me up. Of course, he goes in on Monday and they open him right up. And then he's phoning me on, on the following Friday. And the first thing I said is, Dan, you're still alive. <laughs> wow. And so I said Friday. You're alive. He goes, Charlie, you're not going to believe what happens. I said, yep, I will believe what happened. What happened? He said, I was in the recovery room where after you have the operation and they put you out and then you start recovering. And he said, I still had like a tube in, in down here or whatever they put on. And he says, and I'm coming out of it. And he says, and there, there's doctors and there's like about half a dozen of them. And they're all saying the same thing. We're sorry. We're sorry. We're sorry. We're sorry. So he's in French. He's in Quebec. So he's thinking that okay, there's, I'm going to die. So they're sorry. I'm going to die. And he's, and he's like, I'm going to die. Right. And they go, no, we're sorry because we didn't think that you would live. And so we opened you up. And so you have a scar and he's got a scar like this. It goes right from here. And it's not straight. It's like a cadaver. It just goes right down here. And it goes from one side right to the other side. They just open them up like that. That's how they, over 200 stitches opened them up because they didn't think he was going to live. Because they had, and they they showed him his lungs. They're spotted with cancer, like two days before. They spotted with cancer, every lymph gland, cancer, all your organs, cancer. But you know what? By the time they opened him up, all that cancer died. It dropped dead. It died. He had no cancer, nowhere, not one place, no cancer, no nothing, no zero. But it took him two hundred stitches, so he's got this. It's like a cross, but it's this whole right from here here to here and, and it was like this jagged like, like an old tuna can they used to open them up so my brother's got that scar and and testimony of and that was that's probably like uh probably like that's what about 30 years 35 years ago i don't know but the the, the thing is this god is good do you feel him or not feel him feel him yes don't feel him just keep going and so i've learned that 
And 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 you say, well, what if you pray for somebody and they and, they, and you know they die? That's that's happened too. I've had God tell me, you're going to pray for people to get saved, but they're going to pass away. But they're going to get saved, get them saved. So that's what I did. Yeah, and especially people with cancer. I don't know. God would send me I and mean, people. I'd walk in the room. You could hardly stand the smell. I mean, they are in death's door. I remember one guy. He was French, and I walked in, and he could hardly. He was he was going to be gone in a few hours. And I just leaned over and I said to him, do you understand English a little bit? He goes, yeah. He goes, yeah. I says, you know what? Jesus really, really loves you. And I said, you're going to be going into eternity in a few hours. And he goes, I know. I said, how would you like to know that you go to heaven? That you, that, and, and he goes, how? I said, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. He goes, oh, but I'm Catholic. I said, that's fine. But Jesus died for Catholics too. He died for you and me. And I, and, and, um, the nurses and doctors didn't like me coming in. So I actually came in once and they chased me out. I came back and I led him to the Lord and the peace of God that came in there. Just whoosh, death left and peace came. Same as my brother. Death left, peace came. And so, and, and then he, he, I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that he was saved. Then he died a few hours later. <clears throat> Why didn't you raise him from the dead? I don't know. I, I, but I, I did what God told me to do. Get him saved. You guys, God is good. And if you're sick now in the name of Jesus, I just release peace over your life. I release peace over your life. I release peace. Why? Shalom, shalom, shalom. Nothing broken, nothing missing. See, shalom is perfect healing, spirit, soul, and body. Shalom over your life. Peace over your life. Death goes away. Peace comes. And shalom fills your life and fills your room. You know, keep crying out to God. Keep keep pressing into God. Never give up on God. Never, 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 never give up. Never give up on God. Yeah. God's a good God. Anyway, you know what? It's over time. And um, we've got the weekend. I'm going to be with Sammy tomorrow in Alberta. So check out, uh, you know, some of the things that I've said. You might want to watch the rebroadcast. Maybe there's somebody who needs to hear this message. Tell them. Go and listen to it and uh, on, on Sammy's uh, Voice Revival. And we're just going to believe for healing, signs, wonders, heaven, all these things. That's what I'm believing for. And we're going to see it. I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. Okay, God bless you. And uh, I know Sammy tells you this, your Voice Revival and your voice matters. And it really does matter. Open your mouth and God's going to fill it. He filled mine. Many times I don't know what, what to say. And, and it just comes out. Now, a lot of people say, does that happen all the time? No, it doesn't happen all the time. It's not all the time, 24 hours a day. But when I need it, that's when God comes through. When you need it, he's there. When, when you need a savior and you realize you need one, you'll have one. Everybody needs one. But when you realize you need one, that's when, you have, that's, that's when he comes. Okay, well, God bless you. And have yourself a great weekend. Love you guys. The Voice Revival family. Bless you.